So I'm recording. Uh, you're muted. Well, you'll have Paul. to. I, I had to. I had to mute everybody, Paul. So you have to unmute yourself. My apologies for that. There we go. Okay, we did mute everyone. All right. <laughs> um, so hello and welcome. Uh, this is the second of our new quarterly lectionary series on Zoom. Uh, I'm Paul Nectarline. I'm a member of Theology and Peace, going back to. Uh, just about the beginning, 2008, I think, is when I first came. Um, our speaker tonight is Professor Brian Robinette of Boston College, who will be giving a talk on his recent book, The Difference Nothing Makes, Creation, Christ, Contemplation. And Brian, we're glad you're here. Um, uh, they've I'm also asked to give a brief introduction to theology and peace itself uh, for those who may be somewhat new. Um, that it was founded in 2007 by a group of pastors who joined in coalition with um, scholars from the academic study group Colloquium on Violence and Religion. That's the the group that more widely gets together to discuss Rene Girard's work, his memetic theory. Um, and these were peace, pastors and uh, folks from cover coming together to try to bring uh, Girard's memetic theory to a wider audience of pastors, uh, practitioners and peace and justice activists. So theology and peace stresses a mix of theory and practical application with an emphasis on the prophetic dimension of mimetic theory in understanding how violence impacts our world and how the church might respond. Several years into its existence, the organization began to take racism and the church's response to it as a central concern forging a connection with the newborn community in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Theology and Peace um, sponsors a contributing theologian. That's history now. Uh, Tony Bartlett was um, the first and uh, I followed him and I don't believe we have that uh, position filled at the moment, but um, we put on an annual conference uh, with some well-known speakers, um, which have included Brian McLaren and Naomi Tutu, the daughter of Desmond Tutu. During the global pandemic year, uh, Theology and Peace partnered with a sister organization, the Raven Foundation, and produced the Collaborators Conference online uh, and now as we emerge out of the pandemic, we're beginning to try to do some new things again and take advantage of the Zoom that we all learned uh, during that pandemic. Uh, and so tonight we're uh, thrilled to have the second in our series of events. Um, we do, I think before we finish tonight, we'll uh, I think we have Adam Erickson lined up for sometime in August on a Thursday night. And exciting uh, news, too, that we're going to get back to an in-person conference October 5th through 8th, and we'll say more about that um, a little later. Uh, but let me get to introducing Brian and so that he can take it away and um, with... Uh, what I'm really looking forward to a conversation about his new book. Uh, Brian Robinette began his professional career uh, when he received his PhD in systematic theology from University of Notre Dame in 2003. And he's pretty much been a teacher of theology 
uh, in the academy since then, beginning with St. Louis University from 2003 to 2012. Uh, and then for the past 10 plus years now at Boston University, where he's currently an associate professor. Um, I first became acquainted with Brian's work in 2010 when he contacted me out of the blue about his uh, now award-winning book, uh, Grammars of Resurrection. And I remember reading it with much interest in airports on the way to theology and peace events. <laughs> um, uh, that's one of my first memories of, of that book. Uh, it's, uh, I've used it in my preaching and teaching. The first part argues very compellingly for the importance of the resurrection being bodily. Uh, and then connecting that bodily resurrection to uh, an elaboration in the second part on three grammars of resurrection. Um, let me see, uh, just very quickly. Uh, the first one is reversal in terms of overturning the resurrection, overturning the guilty verdict on Jesus. Um, second is a double reversal in terms of Forgiveness, forgiveness, even for the perpetrators. Um, I think he makes use quite a bit of James Allison in this part and um, the forgiving victim. Uh, and then fulfillment in terms of launching new creation. Uh, he makes heavy use of mimetic theory and Girardian theologians, theologians, especially in the second part of that book. Uh, and so he caught my attention for being a possible speaker at Theology and Peace Conferences. And that opportunity um, came about uh, just a couple of years later, uh, especially when I came across a 2012 essay of his titled Deceit, Desire, and the Desert. Rene Girard's mimetic theory in conversation with early monast Christian monastic practice. Um, it was included in a book of essays um, uh, very much about mimetic theory called Violence, Transformation, and the Sacred. Uh, I re recommend getting that book. Uh, Margaret File and Tobias Winwright edited it. But in our preparations for the 2014 Theology and Peace Conference, the board was talking about the importance of contemplative prayer for the peace movement. And Brian's essay not only argued that point, but um, happened to do so from the perspective of mimetic theory. We could hardly believe <laughs> our fortune for someone writing on contemplative practice from uh, that perspective. And so, um, Brian made his first presentation to Theology and Peace in 2014 conference, and then again, um, 2017, and um, with that work, I think it's kind of morphed into uh, some of what he's doing in his new book that we're going to talk about here in a moment, um, but also uh, was published uh, as an essay in Contagion back in 2017, Contemplative Practice and the Therapy of Mimetic Desire, how contemplative practice is important to healing the, the negative effects of mimetic desire. Um, so tonight we're delighted to invite Brian back to Theology and Peace uh, to engage us in conversation about his brilliant new book, the Difference Nothing Makes, Creation, Christ, Contemplation. And um, if it's helpful to you at some point tonight, Brian, too, um, I have this, uh, this uh, uh, outline of, of Brian's book here. Um, you can see that the first part introduces his arguments about creation out of nothing, creatio ex nilo. And already in chapter two, he begins to argue that uh, um, 
contemplative practice is necessary to, to Christian theology and to Christian practice. Uh, and the middle section on Christ, um, very much Gerardian. You can tell by the titles, Jesus and the non-other, um, natural born empathizers, the we centricity of the self, um, the genesis of rivalry with the tug of mine, double trouble, um, uh, Jesus and the other other. <laughs> so you can see uh, and uh, Brian will uh, help this uh, come alive uh, in telling his story of coming upon mimetic theory and uh, the importance of this book to um, his theology and to theology in general. So um, welcome, Brian. We are very glad to have you today. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. That was very nice, very thorough too. And uh, to see a to see an outline like that is that your own outline or was? Yeah, you... I just I just uh, went through the book and wrote down the the, uh, the um the the chapter titles and the titles of the headings of the different sections. So um, it's pretty much just straight from your book. Well, it, it's very much appreciated. Maybe at some point I will have you show that up on the screen again if we want to get into some of the nitty gritty of uh, of uh, some of the chapter headings and subheadings. But anyway, I want to thank you for that. And um, thank you for the friendship too, uh, for um, extending this invitation and uh, Karen for your invitation and uh, the communication. I, I recognize uh, a, a couple of you and uh, I've met uh, some of you and, but I think most of you I'm meeting for the first time. So thank you for having me with you. And I, and I look forward to getting to know um, you better as the time allows. And especially hearing your comments, your objections as the case may be, your questions. I envision this being um, a dialogical affair rather than a, a, a presentation. I, what I thought I would do is, is in about 20 or so minutes, just share with you a little bit about how I got into the study of mimetic theory, what it's meant to me as a teacher, as a scholar, as a Christian, and then to say a few words about how that aspect of the book um, is working. And so I know that most of you will have come to the book through that particular angle. And that's one of the one of the pillars of the of the text. And the text does a few other things as well, of course. Uh, but I, I will focus on that for the for the purposes of conversation because I think that's probably the most obvious bridge. Um but I would also like to make the connection as Paul has already articulated here between the insights of mimetic theory and contemplative practice. And I know that that's been a theme that's been explored by theology and peace um, over the, over the recent years. And, and I think that there are some, some um, very promising things that can, can be developed both in terms of Christian contemplative practice and mimetic theory in their interaction with one another. So first of all, just a little bit of, of, of um, introduction uh, to myself and to my work by way of mimetic theory. I came across the work of Rene Girard when I was a doctoral student at the University of Notre Dame. And, and uh, shortly thereafter, I came across the work of James Allison, and that opened up a lot of um, floodgates for me. I'd been doing a fair amount of work on eschatology, Christian eschatology, uh, theologies of, of, uh, of the resurrection. And towards the end of writing my dissertation, when I came across Girard, I, I thought um, I would have probably rewritten that piece had I come across his, his thought earlier. And uh, when I had the opportunity to, to write my first book, well, after the the dissertation phase, when I was at St. Louis University, it ended up 
playing a much more significant role, very pivotal role in that text as it does in this in this current one. What I found, there were a number of things about Girard's work that was so important to me, but but chief among them was really the problem of evil and the problem of, of violence and conflict. I would say that probably the two most dominant questions in my adult life have been, on the one hand, the the uh, the question about the nature of of uh, of existence, namely, why is there anything at all rather than nothing? Why is this all here? And why am I conscious? Why are we conscious? Where does consciousness come from? It all seems very miraculous. But when you actually begin to open up your mind to the very fact that we exist and that we're conscious can also be a source of anxiety or a source of terror, um, angst. And so the question of the why arising from the awareness of, of existing and um, at all rather than nothing, that's been sort of a huge part of my um intellectual and and spiritual journey i would say but the other one has been why is the this world uh this life um on the one hand so uh beautiful filled filled with uh wonderment and at the same time so conflictual so much filled with brokenness and agonism violence and why is it that we uh, not just disagree with one another or enter into conflict from time to time, but perhaps unique to our species, engage in um, um, the willful destruction of one another? Where does that really come about? How could both of these be true? On the one hand, the the sheer wonderment of existence and the beauty of that. And on the other hand, the terrifying realization that um, creatures who find themselves in this world without having been previously in, uh, consulted, here, here we are in this world, um, living mortal lives and yet so often at each other's throat. Where does that really come about? The gratuity and the brokenness, both of those um questions came to me over and over again. Well, it so happens that Gerard has a very good diagnostic of how it is, why it is that human beings find themselves in conflict so often. And once you once you get the few main pillars of Gerard's thought and you begin to see their inner coherence, you can't unsee it. You you see it in your life, you see it in other people's lives, you see it in literature, you see it in movies, you see it in the newspapers, you see it everywhere. It's sort of like the Girardian frames or the or the uh, the goggles. And it's a kind of x-ray vision I have found over the years where I can I, I it's not like I can read people's minds and totally discern all of my desires, but it's that kind of insight that once you get it, um, a whole lot more that about human life that is puzzling or contradictory suddenly snaps into place. You may not be able to say rationalize it, but you can at least it, uh, make more sense out of it, becomes more intelligible. And I just thought that that was such an extraordinary gift on the part of Girard to offer others. And it's not as though Girard imagined that he came upon these insights simply by his own cleverness. I mean, he was, he was a ferociously intelligent person, but he always regarded himself as being profoundly indebted, of course, to uh, the Jewish and Christian scriptures and to philosophers and theologians and artists and novelists and so on. He is a, a is one of those thinkers, as they call him a hedgehog thinker. He's got a couple of really uh, intense ideas that he tries to 
um, develop and to expand their explanatory range. But he um, he was very effective in doing that. I found myself convinced. And among the things that that provided me is not only just a way of reading my own desires and my own engagements with other people and and uh, making otherwise um, mysterious phenomena more tractable to me, but it really helped me with the engagement of the Christian theological tradition and especially scripture. And I bet that a number of you have found that to be the case too. And you read the scriptures and you wonder why it is that violence plays such a significant role in it. Um, and, you know, in other words, what is conflict and violence doing in sacred scripture? How are we to read difficult passages? How are we to understand something of the fundamental dynamics of, of Jesus's life, his death, his resurrection? Um, and furthermore, how can we have a better way of critiquing, let's say, unhealthy unproductive interpretations of those of those scriptures which we find in the christian tradition so anyway that was my my experience of gerard and i have found him to be one of about a half dozen figures i have consulted over and over again in a sense kind of live with it's not just an intellectual preoccupation it's a kind of an existential commitment i have found to be engaged in the seminal ideas of his thought and the way that's been developed by other people and in, in theological and other kinds of registers, and in a way that's frankly been very transformative for me. So it shows up in my work in a in a variety of ways. It certainly in the in this particular text that we're to discuss today. And I have to say maybe this will come up in the QA uh, a little bit later, but it also shows up in my teaching. In other words, I use uh, the insights of mimetic theory um, extensively in the classroom, especially the undergraduate classroom. And I have found that there are ways of introducing that material which allows students who would otherwise be um, rather put off by taking a theology core requirement or um, at least mildly interested, curious, just basically curious, but introducing some of that material to them allows so much of what it is that we'll explore in, in the in the course of the semester to become alive for them in a way that I don't think it otherwise would. So that may resonate with you because I know that a number of you are engaged in catechesis or pastoral ministry or teaching and other kinds of professions where you're instructing others in the faith. So that might be something we can discuss at some point. Uh, just a couple of words about the uh, about the about the book. Um, as Paul so ably, pointed out the the book the difference nothing makes creation christ contemplation is really in three main parts and uh the first part is is really an effort to work through scripture and subsequent philosophical and theological traditions regarding this claim that christian the Christian tradition has made for many centuries, which is that creation comes from nothing, ex nihilo. It comes from nothing. Um, that's a curious phrase, <laughs> to be sure. What does it mean? Why did the why did uh, as really early in the in the in the in the second century? Why was it that? theologians across quite a spectrum came to affirm that creation comes from nothing using this phrase but not just the phrase but the concept behind it what was what was so important for that uh to be this um kind of consensus understanding about creation and the reason why i am interested in it be in, in exploring that from a biblical historical you know doctrinal point of view is that in recent decades this claim has been contested um in essence what what creation from nothing um where it really derives from that particular phrase is with christian theologians engaging in certain kinds of disputes with uh, especially other theologians or or uh, philosophers 
who claimed that or who understood that God creates through the manipulation or engagement with pre-existing matter, that there has always been from eternity matter, a material substrate out of which form is generated, living beings uh, by a creative principle, God or some demiurge. It was sort of like the background understanding of, of, um, of a certain kind of intellectual space um, in the in the Greco-Roman world. And Christian theologians found this objectionable because on the one hand, they regarded that uh, the, the assumption that God is in creating from pre-existent matter is actually a limitation upon God. It suggests that there is some co-creative principle with God. And so therefore God and not God is sort of in a constant duality, you might say. And so if God is like an active forming principle and matter is a passive informing principle, that may help us to appreciate something about the, the creativity of God, but it seems to presuppose a certain kind of limitation. And so the phrase creation from nothing simply means to, to point out that there is nothing that is co eternal with God, that nothing is presupposed in God bringing all things into being. All creation comes to be through an act of God that is utterly gratuitous. It's not imposed upon God. There's no metaphysical necessity. There's no lack in God. It's not as though God needs a world in order to complete God's self. Creation comes to be through an in, it, incomprehensible to us, but an utterly free act on the part of God. And so there's nothing actually that stands in between God and creation. So that was one part of this affirmation. But there was another part of this affirmation of creation from nothing. And that was that a number of Christian theologians were contending with some competing claims about the origin of evil the origin of sin or evil. And there was a fairly widespread assumption that evil may not be created by God, but evil is somehow incipient within matter. That there's something about matter that is at its root kind of broken or not just limited, but susceptible to failure. And um, so in other words, matter is sort of like the seedbed of evil. And of course, if you're working within a Christian register and you're affirming that God creates all things and said it was good and created human beings and said it was very good. And then, of course, you know, affirms that God became human, became flesh, became, you know, material creature. Then um, any kind of lingering assumption that matter has some kind of principle of evil in it would be very contradictory to a Christian understanding of creation and its inherent goodness. So it, it was at least on these two fronts that Christian theologians were um, keen to affirm that, again, creation comes from nothing, meaning wholly from God, without any presupposition, and that creation in all of its aspects is fundamentally or originally good, which isn't to deny that there is evil or uh, sin or suffering. That's a different kind of conversation and important and, and immediately related as it turns out. But this is a, a very important to claim. So anyway, that's kind of the, 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 like the, the rationale for, for the doctrine. But I said that there have been some people in uh, various philosophical and theological quarters in recent decades who have taken issue with this doctrine, creation from nothing. And one of the reasons why is because it is assumed that if God creates from nothing, then God, as omnipotent, controls everything and, in a sense, is like a puppet master. You know, so it's like it raises the question about divine power and do creatures have any agency if God is omnipotent? If God creates from nothing, you know, what role does creatures have in shaping their own destiny? 
Related to this, of course, is the problem of evil. If God is all good and all powerful, and yet there is evil in the created order, and if God could have prevented that, then God is, in a sense, on the hook. That how do we how do we justify uh, God creating and, and God's goodness if God could prevent evils uh, occurring on the scale that they do? So it, this sort of intensifies the problem of evil. And so some have um, come to the conclusion that God is good, but God may be limited. God may be conditioned by the world, that the reason why there's evil and suffering is not because God allows it um, and could otherwise stop it from happening, but there's a limitation that God has. And so therefore, God is in a sense kind of contending with the limitation of the created order um, and um, is working with creatures to overcome it. You can kind of see how that would relieve some of the intellectual pressures about, you know, the problem of evil is just to affirm that God is limited in some way. So a big part of the, of the impetus for this book was to retrieve, basically to go and, and to understand why this doctrine came about historically, but also to appreciate um, with a in a kind of a renewed way, the importance of this doctrine, including in light of some of the objections that have been raised uh, against it in recent decades. So the first part has a kind of argumentative, I mean, not that I'm arguing for the sake of argumentation, but it has a thesis. And I, I really want to defend the doctrine and to show that, as a matter of fact, the affirmation that creation comes from nothing is um, not at all to suggest that God is a puppet master and that creatures, including human beings, don't have freedom, but it's actually a robust way of affirming that God endows creation with freedom, with agency, and that God and cre creation are not in competition. And this will, when I put it in this in this way, in a moment, maybe a, a, a bell will ring in terms of the connection with mimetic theory. God and creature are not rivals. God is not some big other against which human beings are striving or contending in order to try to establish their identity, um, uh, are threatened by God, you know, in terms of, of uh, caprice. Um, that God creates creation in a way that creatures are able to participate in their own create coming to be. They are endowed with a certain degree of freedom that enables creatures to participate in their own creativity. And that this is not somehow um, a matter of competition with God, but this is precisely what God wills. This is precisely how God is, is to, in a sense, communicate or endow God's own freedom to allow creation to participate in divine life. So anyway, the, I throughout the book, I develop what I call a non-contrastive or a non-competitive view of God and creation. I use that phrase from a few other theologians, including Catherine Tanner, but a non-competitive understanding of the God-world relation, and then elaborate that throughout various aspects of creation theology, creation imagination, creation practice, including Christology, our understanding of who Christ is, um, and also themes related to spiritual practice. And in some cases, I do some, some I, I venture into some area of uh, political theology. Anyway, I think it's very important that we um, under, try to appreciate the background assumptions with which we are working when it comes to understanding the God-world relation. And if we have some assumption that God and creation are competitive, are on the same plane, and in a some, somewhat a dialectical relationship with one another, then this is going to have an impact on a whole host of things in the Christian tradition and Christian practice. <laughs> And uh, we can maybe spell some of those out later. 
So that's part one. Part two um, is dedicated really to exploring the the role that um, mimetic theory can play with this. And I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about this at length. I imagine this will come up in our conversation. But um, what I essentially do in this in the middle part of this this in the the second of these three parts is to stage a way of reading the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus as a way of allowing us to appreciate really what the true nature of the God-world relation is like and what the true nature of creation or the true destiny of creation is. So, for example, and I do this in the Grammars of Resurrection book as well, but it is an extraordinary thing that in the um, near immediate aftermath of Jesus's death on the cross, the resurrection event in which God allows Jesus, the crucified Jesus, to be perceived or known or experienced after this trauma, but in a mode of peace, the offering of shalom, and the mode of pardon, of forgiveness, and the summon to life in a community um, of koinonia, of love, of service, and of um, of humility, of mutual uplift, that that was the actual effect of a lynching. That you that it would seem that God's response would have been, let's say, um, a kind of judgment that was reactive to the the horrific death that Jesus suffered, the 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 violence that uh, was so graphically displayed on the cross, the fact that this primitive Christian movement arose from a source experience in which God was discovered as having been in the midst of that, but having been our victim, and yet having communicated God's self by way of an utterly gratuitous act of peace, of forgiveness, and of summoning to communion. This is the greatest reversal, the thinkable. And it was from that experience that, of course, the earliest Christians began to, sort of like the Emmaus story, they, they came to experience in retrospect all it is that Jesus said and all it is that he did, including the this horrific eventuality of his death, and had a completely different framework to interpret it and to understand it and to live out its significance. And it's not only that they saw differently um, this horrific event of the cross, um, and it's not only that they saw differently all it is that Jesus said and that he taught leading up to that um, event, but also further back, they began to read and reread the story of Israel differently in light of the resurrection. And going further, coming to a different way of understanding the, what creation is from the beginning. And there are these remarkable understandings in the New Testament that come very early on in which Christians are affirming Jesus as the firstborn of the dead and simultaneously as the one through whom all things came into being. In other words, that Christ is the original archetype for creation. Christ is the one through whom creation really comes to be. It's what creation is meant to be from the beginning. And so you have this kind of amazing telescoping of Christian anticipation of the future resurrection on the one hand, and on the other hand, looking retrospectively at the origin of creation and seeing it as um, 
ordered to the incarnation or ordered to the life of Christ. So that is a big part of that middle um, unit of, 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 the, of the text, which is to give a, a using Girard and, and a host of other figures who are who are who work in the area of mimetic theory or who are friendly to it, of doing this thick reading of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection, but then using that thick reading as a way of showing how in in primitive Christianity and subsequent uh, Christian theology, a radically new understanding of creation opens up. And one of the most important ways to sum that up is to say that Christians affirmed um, categorically that creation is from nothing, meaning it's utterly gratuitous, that creation is not um, originally a matter of conflict or violence, but is one of original peace. That God's endowing of creation with freedom and a certain kind of integrity and a capacity for dynamic unfolding, for novelty, is not one that is a, originally one of agonism, but is really one of a letting be, if you like, allowing for a making way for um, the um, extraordinary adventure of creation, including the the possibility that creatures will fall into brokenness and, and sin and conflict, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, that's the, that's the second part of, uh, of the text. And the third part, which I won't actually go into detail uh, really here, except on an as needed basis in the Q and a, um, I developed this theme of incarnation uh, more um, and then make more explicit connection with some 20th century and some 21st century figures ranging from the Catholic theologian Karl Rahner to um, the Russian Orthodox theologian uh, Sergius Bulgakov, who have developed really extraordinary theologies of creation um, that show a very close relationship between creation and incarnation, basically affirming that God creates not just simply to endow creatures with this capacity for their own um, creative participation and the unfolding of their lives in a kind of drama, but that God creates in such a way that God wills from all eternity to become creaturely to share in our creatureliness, to become human. So it's not that the incarnation is just simply like a like a, a, a second thought, if you like, on God's part. It's that creation is endowed from the very beginning with this capacity for God to assume it as God's own life, which God does, of course, in Christ. And so creation is the scene of our communion with God in which God um, shares in our creatureliness by taking it on in, in Christ. So that's what the that third and that final part of, of the text does. But I think it's probably good enough for now to uh, kind of set the, the, the scene. There's probably a lot in there that you may want to engage but there's there's plenty of of uh, other material that may be more pertinent to your own questions or your own interests that uh, we could pick up right away. So I'm very open to however you would like to proceed. Okay, thank you very much, um, both for providing like your personal journey towards mimetic theory, as well as your um, building your theological. Um, foundation and the extrapolations you've made uh, with the mimetic theory. Um, what I'm gonna do is let you take a, a breath there. I invite people to put your questions in the chat. Uh, that is the way we're going to sort of be able to you know, monitor and, and uh, give everybody a chance to get their questions answered or observations uh, for Brian. 
Um, I am going to shamelessly promote um, the Theology and Peace October uh, gathering. I believe it begins October 5th. Uh, it will be at Casa Iscali, uh, which is just south in the greater Chicago uh, area. Uh, we have as speakers, uh, the plenary speakers are Pastor Adam Erickson, who works on the theme of God's nonviolent love, as does Dr. Sharon Put of Messiah University. Um, and we will have more opportunity to engage in small group uh, uh, engagements, to be able to talk to each other in breaks, and to be able to explore mimetic theory and what we are calling communicating God's nonviolent love uh, with the good news we're promoting is that God's love overcomes violence. Um, so continue to watch for more messages about that. Um, and so uh, what I want to uh, start Brian off with is that uh, in an effort to get to know you, uh, you don't know me before this uh, becoming the moderator of these themes and making sure at least uh, I understood it. I kind of uh, looked up on YouTube if you were were there, and I found uh, this Agape podcast where you had spoken with uh, a number of uh, Boston, I think, college students uh, there, and you gave a very personal rendition of your uh, uh, path to um, theology and uh, contemplation. But we have something in common, which is and. That I, too, uh, I had been a lawyer in my first life and was having my own sort of spiritual, I wouldn't call it is, is distress, but that something was missing. And so I went to the Gethsemane Abbey, where I, too, spent uh, about four days in silence, complete silence, uh, you know, on my own, uh, attending some of the, um, when the monks would meet together or I found that they, you could talk to them in the bookstore and various things. And the thought came to me for the first time that I should go, go to seminary. And so after that, I did in fact go to seminary. Um, we, we kind of went a different direction. I was raised Catholic and I, you never quite become un-Catholic, uh, but I entered a uh, Protestant denomination known as Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I went to Christian Theological Seminary in Indiana, by the way, another mm -hmm. connection although I'm not from Indiana. So anyway, I thought, um, I think a lot about how Thomas Merton has influenced so many people and how even um, those of you who take time to write theology down and to express views uh, have an impact on future generations that you can't necessarily anticipate. I met other people in seminary who had, uh, the same thing happened. They go to see the the Abbey, and next thing you know, they're off uh, as converts, so to speak. So I didn't know if you might want to share that story as I'm looking for and giving people an opportunity to put questions in the chat. Sure, I will I can do a, a brief version of that. What a lovely uh, connection, though. There's yeah. uh, there are a lot of uh, in, um, really wonderful convergences there. But yes, that... Um, um, when I was a young, when I, shortly after I had graduated from college, I had I had taken a job at an advertising agency and was headlong into that before I had you know the proverbial quarter life crisis and uh, realized that I needed to make a very significant shift, but I wasn't yet really sure where that was going. That would obviously end up being in the study of theology, but. Um, making the time to to really explore that uh and in silence was was really crucial probably prevented a midlife crisis but <laughs> i don't want to speak too soon i'm actually beyond midlife i guess um but as you say i was i i had um you know i i quit my job i became you know a janitor at a at a um at an Episcopal church in 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 um, um, in Nashville area, and and it was a big shocker to a lot of my <laughs> friends and family, but uh, I I really felt the need to live a, a 
really a quasi monastic life. And during that time had the benefit of having a spiritual director who really helped sort things through with me, uh, both in terms of uh, the, my marriage, which, and I had, hadn't been married for that long, my wife, Krista, um, and, uh, and then also, you know, the possibility of a vocation coming out of that. So the importance of mentorship, the importance of silence, and then the, um, um, the pilgrimage to the Abbey of Gethsemane and reading Thomas Merton and figures like that. Um, you know, Merton uh, has been probably uh, as important as someone like Rene Girard has been for me all, all of these years. Mm -hmm. And that may have something to do with the connection between mimetic theory and, and, and contemplation, which I've been working on for quite some time. Um, but anyway, that's probably enough for now. Um, I could say more, but um, that was a lovely event to do. And that was at Boston College. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they call they call that the Agape Latte. And it's a, yeah, it's a regular yeah. event that they do with, with college students uh, there who are maybe going through their own quarter life mm -hmm. crisis. Yes, thank you. And that leads to one of two questions that are out there. And this one is from Paul which is in fact, what is the significance of your of contemplative practices to the themes of the book? Yes, good. Thank you, Paul. So um, I have, as, as I alluded to, I have been um, for over two decades really interested in how contemplative prayer, contemplative practice, contemplative sensibilities can be more integrated in Christian life, um, in Christian theology. And certainly that's rooted in my own sense of having a, a kind of contemplative vocation, really. Sort of, I, I live my, my life as a married monk, I think. Um, I have a monastic heart. Uh, and a mar and and a married heart too, but um, the contemplative journey has has been um, a very significant one for me, and I've written on it. And in this book, I endeavored to make a stronger case for why and uh, why contemplative practice, contemplative prayer, ought to be more thoroughly integrated with the craft of theology, and. Um, and I don't just simply make a, you know, a, like a, 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 um, a case for it in, in abstract terms. I really try to incorporate a contemplative sensibility throughout, throughout the book. And so um, to give you some sense of what I mean by that, probably, I mean, the word contemplation or, or the, or, you know, contemplative is, it's a, it's a pretty plastic term. It can mean a lot of things for a lot of different people. But for me, it really means uh, a certain kind of disposition and an attitudinal openness to silence, to inner stillness. And that doesn't mean that it comes as a, uh, as a competitor with words or ideas or sensations and perceptions, anything of that sort. But by by silence, I really I don't mean just um, not speaking words or or not having um, thoughts. I mean a, a, a fundamental awareness, a basic awareness um, that we all actually have. It's not something we need to acquire, but a fundamental awareness that we have in which we are. And it is inherently peaceful. It's inherently open and luminous. Um, it's inherently inclusive. It is very unassuming. It's so unassuming, as a matter of fact, that we hardly notice it. It's like we look right past it. Um, but every now and again, we can experience something or have more of a direct recognition of this and, and, sus and suspect that there are depth, 
there are depths within us that go deeper than words and ideas and, you know, a lot of mental chatter, um, and which is present in our very being and as our very being. And when we are actually really in touch with this and rely upon it, trusting it, in a sense, relaxing into it, our lives are changed. They can be changed. That the that the that the way in which we usually think about ourselves and others, and this is relevant to mimetic theory, is we, we tend to identify ourselves with a host of thoughts about ourselves, certain roles or thoughts, clusters of of memories where we say, I am this, or I'm this image, or this collection of images. And we also do this with other people. So when we encounter other people, we assume that we know who and what they are um, on the basis of our thoughts about them, kind of our impressions or often our reactive judgments, our constant comparisons with other people. And what happens when people spend time in silence, becoming more open to the um, the depth dimensions of their being, is they realize is that um, the self that they often identify with is actually a very partial and fragmented representation of their of their deepest being, and this is true of other people. Um, and so a, a shift can actually uh, occur when we, rather than relying so much on our judgments about ourselves or other people, we work in a more intuitive way with the, the felt sense of our being and this fundamental awareness um, that, as I say, inherently peaceful, inclusive, luminous, it's intelligent, but it's not um, always at the um, at at the uh, tips of our fingers. It's not exactly quite graspable. Contemplative practice or contemplative prayer is simply um, a way of of developing a certain kind of skill to be more in tune with that. Today, you hear a lot about in secular contexts of mindfulness. This is deeper than mindfulness, but there's something that's that's relevant about mindfulness. When we become aware of, um, more in touch with the awareness that is not the same thing with our thoughts. Um, but you know, the Christian tradition has an extraordinary lineage of of spiritual practitioners and spiritual directors and spiritual masters who have conveyed over centuries and centuries this kind of contemplative wisdom and it's just simply not known as much as it ought to be and i think that as as christian faith especially in certain western contexts over the past two or three centuries has become more and more associated with modern technological you know uh individualistic frameworks, we have become less aware of this depth dimension of the Christian tradition. And I think that this affects um, our spirituality. I think it affects our parishes. I think it affects how we teach theology. Um, um, it affects also the craft of, of theology. So anyway, that's probably enough to get us started with that. Should we anybody want to pursue that more? But I'm I'm very interested in this because when, for instance, uh, Girard or other figures with whom we may have some familiarity talk about mimetic rivalry and these constant comparisons um, of projection upon others or, or trying to secure an identity that's over and against an other, whether this be in, you know, in interpersonal or in social groups, what is happening there is a... Um, an identification with um, discursive mind and an eclipse of this depth dimension that we all actually have and more fundamentally are 
And so I think that a huge part of dealing with mimetic rivalry and the negative aspects of mimetic desire is not just simply becoming conscious about this in terms of intellectual understanding, but it's also um, becoming more in touch with that which is not caught up in mimetic rivalry. And so contemplative practice is a is uh, as to use the phrase that I that uh, Paul mentioned in an article, uh, contemplative practice and the therapy of mimetic desire. I think that contemplative practice is, is a very important way of uh, disarming human beings from being caught up in, in mimetic comparison and rivalry and conflict. Muted myself. So, um, Andrew, I see your question, but I'm going to follow up. Um, uh, Suella Su asked something that really is right out of what you just said, and I'm going to ask it to see if there's any more you'd like to say on it, which is given what you're saying about our capacity for silence and contemplation, would you say then the absence of silence and comp contemplation opens us up for violence? Yes, I do. I, I I do. I I think, and, and what I would only qualify that at, um, by just saying that by silence, I I mean um, something like awareness. So it can be somewhat limiting to refer to silence because we think of it as being in a quiet space or a quiet room or something like that. And that can be very practically difficult for people to have. Um, it turns out that that kind of silence is not necessary for the more, the kind of inner stillness or inner silence that I'm talking about. But yes, to answer this question, I think that um, if if any if anyone has had um, an, some even preliminary experience of, of um, some kind of contemplative practice, one of the things that you'll notice almost immediately is how noisy your mind is. Mm -hmm. It's it's constantly churning with ideational content, memories, snap judgments, uh, half-formed concepts, um, automatic thinking, essentially. And the fact is that most of us, most of the time, live our lives caught up in that psychodrama. And when we're caught up in that psychodrama, we are um, in a reactive state, usually to other people and also to our own internal states. So we can get irritated, uh, jealous, envious, angry, you know, all of the things that we describe as passions or vices are so much more um, likely when we are lost in the flow of of, uh, of our consciousness, you know, the sort of the, the flow of consciousness. And we're more susceptible of being emotionally hijacked as well. So, you know, you think about how angry you can get. And uh, you, you sort of, it's almost like you, you're hallucinating, you know, you get so caught up in a, in a sort of uh, conflictual mode and a reactive mode, you say things you don't, and you, re you regret later, or you think things that uh, maybe you regret later, and you possibly do things that you regret later. And so I think that when people get caught up in some kind of mimetic rivalry, they are actually in a in a almost semi-conscious state. They're not really present to themselves or present to the other person. They are kind of gripped in this magnetic pull and some sort of tug of war. But it doesn't actually have to be physical, but it can be ideational, you know, jealousy and envy and, you know. And so I think that we are hugely susceptible to conflict when we are caught up in what I'm calling, you know, this the thinking mind, the chatterbox of the mind, or what Buddhists call the monkey mind. And so 
you know, I think all of us have had the experience of how much more um, fruitful and creative our relationships with others, especially those who push our buttons or, you know, who, who are hard for us, how much more we are able to be in difficult situations, including very uncomfortable, painful situations or being in the presence of the suffering of others. Um, when we are more in touch with these depth dimensions that are more accessible to us through contemplative practice. So yes, that's the, that's the, to sum up, yes, we are more susceptible to mimetic conflict when that kind of silence or awareness is, um, is fleeting. I'm going to move from this topic for just a minute. And Andrew asks, um, I know you, you talked about the concept of um, Christus Victor, and he asked, is there any, uh, when working with this motive, uh, is there any risk of stumbling into a duality um, that you, you've you been trying to avoid in your discussion about creation ex, uh, out of nothing, uh, suggesting that does a victor's victory imply that there is a vanquished or defeated? Um, and does that not create its own sort of duality? Great um, question. Yeah. That's a wonderful question. Who who asked that question? Uh, Andrew there, Andrew. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you, Andrew. I, that's a terrific question. The answer is yes, it, 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 it can run that risk. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with what that is, Christus Victor, um, in the in the 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century, there was a scholar um, who provided some a kind of a typology of different ways in which Christians and Christian theologians have tried to understand the nature of redemption. Different models, different paradigms, you might say. Um, I think we're all familiar, in some form or another, of like penal substitution. You know, uh, and probably most of us would be um, very skeptical of that, find it problematic. But, you know, certain atonement theories, basically, how is it that the cross and resurrection of Jesus affect salvation? And um, Christus Victor model or paradigm refers to um, a kind of an interpretive approach in the early centuries of, of Christian theology in the patristic period, as it's sometimes, as it's often called, in which um, God, through the death and resurrection of Christ, overcome in a kind of battle with uh, the accuser or Satan um, or the power of evil, vanquishes the power of evil through the cross. And so this question that Andrew asked um, doesn't that language of vanquishing only replicate some kind of duality? And the answer to that is it can, but doesn't have to. <laughs> um, in other words, all of these models or metaphors are analogies are limited. And so everything really depends on how they actually get articulated. So if you were to develop that particular model um, in a way that suggests that God is using violence, then yes, that would be uh, quite problematic and actually replicate the very problem that uh, that the cross and resurrection would seem to it to address. But what I really love about the Christus Victor model, and I think really the reason why Gerard loves it so much, and he he describes his own engagement with this in a few places, but especially, towards the end of I See Satan Fall Like Lightning. So if anybody is, is interested in exploring that, you could go to that, the last few chapters there. Basically, what I think is so brilliant about this sort of model, and again, it's just a model helping us to try to understand the event of redemption without necessarily being a full explanation of everything, as though there couldn't be other insights or other kinds of models. But it's basically claiming that God defeats 
the power of evil, not through force, not through coercion, but in a sense, by outwitting it or by um, vanquishing it by absorbing it into God's self. It's through a great act of irony or, or paradox, God becomes subject to our violence in order to free us from it. Not in order to um, legitimate the violence, not in order to uh, um, uh, sanction it in that way, but basically to undo its power. So it, it's sort of like um, God was willing to undergo the human rejection of divine grace, even accepting um, that on on a cross, death on a cross, in order to reveal its mechanisms, in order to um, um, expose it of its deceptive power so that we could be freed from it. So when these early theologians are talking about uh, the victory over death or the victory over evil, it's usually within that um, paradoxical framing that they're that they're they're doing that. So um, just to make this a bit more concrete, you know, Jesus doesn't go to his death with the assumption that the death on a cross is itself a good, you know, like it's a good thing in itself, as though state-sponsored terrorism is something that God <laughs> um, endorses in any way. Jesus is willing to go to his death as the consequence of the, of the nature of his ministry. In other words, the resistance to his ministry results in scapegoating. It's not that Jesus wanted to be scapegoating. It's that the way in which he is preaching and enacting the reign of God is so upsetting and so um, challenging to the status quo, so agitating that there are many who are willing to have him um, um, eliminated in order to eliminate this agitation. And uh, the collusion of powers that are involved in Jesus's crucifixion in a way seem to succeed as a result of that. They vanquish him by all lights. And yet through the resurrection, Jesus is affirmed He's vindicated for one thing. When you read, like, say the, um, you know, the the stereotypical preaching in the and 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 uh, Acts, and in Paul, um, Jesus is affirmed as as being innocent and unjustly murdered, and yet at the same time is um, commended to. Um, his followers again and to others who would be his followers as God's offer of peace and forgiveness. And as I was mentioning earlier, a summons to life and community rooted in love. And so that is a defeat. It's overcoming, if you like, the power of death, but the manner of overcoming is deeply subversive. It overcomes it through a, a more profound uh, power, and that's the power of love, which is willing to absorb violence in order to redeem us from having to resort to violence. So anyway, um, I hope that answers your question, Andrew. Uh, I think it um, it all depends on how well that kind of model is used, so long as we are not using it in such a way as to implicate God in violence as though God is doing violence. The discovery of of uh, of God, the the sort of the post Easter discovery of God is one, to use James Allison's phrase, is one in which God is um, purged of all violence. God is utterly nonviolent, and that has to be kept very very clear for those kinds of metaphors and 
uh, paradigms to be, I think, truthful and consistent. Um, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to go one observation uh, from Karen just suggests your words are having influence. She wants to seek a spiritual director who understands Gerard. <laughs> um, so uh, that might be a whole niche that we could create, you know. Um, uh, Wes uh, has asked, uh, how do you see the contempt of life work with or enhance one's work in an academic or pastoral therapeutic activist work. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. By the way, who who made the comment about a, a like a Girardian spiritual director? Karen Mark Karen. Karen up here. That's brilliant. I, I I think I have I have often thought um you know how to in a way operationalize mimetic theory in such a way as to be very impactful in spiritual direction um and other kinds of contexts. I know that there are some people who, who in fact do that, but I think that that would be a remarkable development of that, of that discipline and that practice, spiritual direction and a Girardian key. Um, so the question about the role, the possible impact of, of contemplative practice in, in the classroom in the parish and in therapeutic contexts and the academic context, um, maybe what I would say uh, straight away is that I, just referring to my own um, engagement with this, I teach all of my undergraduates some form of contemplative practice as a regular part of the course. I don't require in any way for them to have a certain kind of um, specifically Christian or religious understanding just simply want to familiarize them with some of the very basics and allow them to experiment with it on, on their own. And they readily take to it. And so I, I actually, I begin most of my classes with, um, with a period of silence, uh, with meditation. Sometimes we'll even do some guidance and this is for students, you know, some of them, um, uh, plenty of them are Christian, Catholic, you know, Protestant, but come from different religious backgrounds or none at all, and maybe even somewhat kind of hostile, you know, um, to having to take a theology course at all. So I think it actually can be done in such a way to be uh, an open invitation for people coming from a lot of different perspectives, because there's no, no one owns silence. <laughs> There's no trademark to um, basic awareness to it. In fact, it is utterly given and gratuitous. It's part of the very fabric of our being. It is the essence of who we are, actually. We're constituted by this. So one doesn't need to have it packaged in a certain kind of way in order for um, others to be alerted to this um, and to become more familiarized with it and to begin to explore it in ways that will make sense to them. So the classroom is, is a place to do this, I think, and um, um, students take to it. But in other contexts, you know, liturgies are are wonderful and they're amazing. I'm, I'm a kind of a liturgically minded person. I love ritual. I love the sacramental life. Um, as a practicing Catholic, um, liturgy is a huge aspect of, of what I understand Christian worship and, and life really to be. The fact, though, is that even uh, more traditional or classical, for lack of a better word, liturgical spaces can be kind of noisy, too busy. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, sometimes our liturgies are just you know they they're uh it's, it's too as as uh in the, the the movie mozart you know amadeus too many notes <laughs> you know sometimes there's just too much going on you know liturgies or or worship can be very vibrant and and should be but i think it's wonderful to actually help uh people become more familiar with silence when you can do this in a corporate way and and i think that uh, in the context of, of worship, 
services or maybe even gathering, you know, beginning prayer or a book club or a dinner or, you know, at the parish or things like that with silence, just building in a little bit of silence together can be really healing. And um, it, it, I think encourages a yearning for more and it becomes easier to integrate with other things. So if you're, I mean, I would encourage any of you who are interested in this and who have some role in directing uh, worship spaces, liturgical spaces, to think about how um, silence can be more of a of a of a foregrounded element in in those contexts. Um, I also think, though, the the biggest part of this is is having at least some kind of uh, commitment to a contemplative practice yourself. And, um, you know, spending, like, having some um, regular period of time, it doesn't have to be every day, but some regular period of time in the course of, of, uh, of a two or three day cycle in which silence actually figures pretty significantly. Um, and there are different ways to to be inducted into that. Certainly praying with script, Lexio Divina is a wonderful way. If you've ever heard of that, praying with scripture where you use images and then um, allow, you know, prayer to become less and less um, image oriented and just simply being in the presence of God without any expectation whatsoever, letting down all defenses and um, trusting that, you know, really sinking into that. So I think that when a person or persons are more in touch with those um, contemplative depth dimensions within themselves, that it becomes natural for that to show up in their relationships with others as well. If they're engaged in in a in a in say a therapy session or counseling or in a teaching or uh, accompanying someone at the hospital or a family member or going through suffering or and especially if you're in, the last part of that question was if you're engaged in certain kinds of activist um campaigns as as I'm sure many of you know when you're really committed to some kind of cause social justice cause let's say the the susceptibility of uh, burnout is high you get uh discouraged you can feel the cynical you can feel that nothing changes you can you know in other words burnout is a is a huge part of being in, involved in ministry or teaching or um social services or uh, advocacy and i think there there it's all the more reason to um be able to be present to one's um fundamental createdness and and open to the presence of God in utter simplicity of spirit without any goal, with any agenda, without any expectation that things are going to have to go this, that, or the other way, without any outcomes whatsoever. And I really believe that um, when one engages in activity, including in high crisis moments, that that uh, pacific, if you like, that peaceful depth dimension will help one um, to feel sustained through um, through crisis, through conflict, through um, um, advocacy in periods of of uh, of drought and 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 temptation to cynicism. So Brian, we're coming up uh, about five minutes to nine. I'm going to, um, there's sort of two questions left here. If I'll give them both to you and perhaps um, uh, you might meld the, the answer together, but one of them is uh, who are some of the theologians and philosophers who you're engaging with? I, I think there's some in your book or responding to with regard to creation ex nihilo and the problem of evil. 
Now, the other question is, um, do you see God as something other than creator? In other words, was there a time when God did not create? Uh, was there a time when there was nothing, nothing? I guess uh, maybe even before God. Um, so I'm going to let you handle those. I'm going to just mention when it's nine o'clock. Uh, because that's when we promise people that it might be ended, but you're free to keep going past nine o'clock in your answer if you uh, wish. I, so, I yeah. will be uh, as on point as I possibly can. I'll keep an eye on my my clock over here. As for the first question, um, some of the figures that I'm engaging in a more uh, critical manner with respect to creation from nothing, the one that I, I engage most um, especially in chapter one, is a philosopher named John Caputo. Uh, his book, The Weakness of God, A Theology of the Event, was published, I think, in 2004, I want to say, early 2000s, somewhere in the mid-2000s. And um, his is an effort to um, to dispense with creatio ex nihilo, creation from nothing, from the point of view of a certain kind of philosophical approach and the, the problem of evil. Another figure I engage there, but less so directly, is, is uh, Catherine Keller, a theologian at Drew University. But the two of them are, are linked, but I engage especially uh, John Caputo there. Um, as far as, um, <laughs> it's an, an incredible question. Um, about creation and what about before creation? Um, it's a perfect way to end because there's almost no answer to this, really. But I do subscribe to the view that, and this will sound a bit speculative, but it's actually pretty well attested to in the tradition. Uh, figures from like Thomas Aquinas, for instance, um, in uh, but also before you know in the medieval period, but also figures before him from the patristic period, um, in both the the uh, the east and west, have the understanding that uh, while it is of course the case that creation is not itself eternal because it is the event of spatio temporality, so it would be a contradiction in terms. Nevertheless that within the mind of God, uh, which is of course eternal, God's eternal intelligence, God has always known uh, creation as such, the very essence of creation, and has known creation, not just say it like in the abstract, but in all of its particularity. So in a seminal way, this is sometimes known as the divine ideas tradition, or it's sort of a, it sounds a little bit, uh, reminiscent of Platonic philosophy, but it's not straight up Platonism. But within the mind of God, the eternal, e eternal intelligence of God, the wisdom of God, before all creation, God has known uh, creation um, in its very essence. And God knows creation within God's self, not as some sort of object outside of, of God. So God if you like, has never not known creation because God is eternal. And, and creation is not sort of a new event for God as though God is sort of like, oh, now I'm going to, uh, a little bored here, let's do this, I'll do something. You know, what will this do? You know, it's not like that. It, God has always known us. And actually, that is a, a profound thought. If you think about it, you can take this, and, and I'm going to end with this, Take this into your own prayer in a way, which is to dis which is to in a more contemplative way, um, feel something of your very being and and allow yourself to become present to yourself as that which God knows from eternity. And as that which God loves from eternity. Our very being is because God, is love. And so to experience and to know ourselves as, as generated by God out of love um, and known by God in our very being um, from God's own eternity is a way of 
very profound self-discovery. And may we know that about ourselves and may we know that about each, each other. Wow, thank you so much. Um, really rich, really uh, engaging, really um, I positive uh, approach to God and creation and the life we can live uh, with God, uh, in love, uh, together with God and each other. Um, thank you for those who submitted questions and who have engaged this conversation uh, this evening with us. We are so thankful that you joined us. Um, if you would like to participate in events in the future, be on the watch for Theology and Peace emails and, and other uh, um, messaging. Uh, please go to theologyandpeace.com, I think it is nowadays, and uh, watch there for announcements of future speakers. Uh, we are glad to say that Theology and Peace uh, did not die during the pandemic, but we're hoping to come back to life and continue to explore these thoughts, uh, which really have uh, such an important so important for the world we live in today. So, uh, Brian, thank you so much. Um, yes, I really appreciate you. your time. If I could um, add something, Brian shared with me a couple days ago um, that there is an online symposium dealing with his book, The Difference Nothing Makes. It's and it's just completely in written form, right? Yes. And so I will send out an uh, an email, a follow up email, um, with a link to that um, yes. symposium that Brian's inviting us to read. Oh, okay. And, uh, and yeah. it may be of interest to note that um, th there are six respondents to the book, and then I offer a reply to them. There are two of them have already been published, and the others are coming. But at least. At least three of them are well-known um, Girard friendly or Girardian scholars, including James Allison, um, uh, Mark Heim, who you may know, his book Saved from Sacrifice. It's a really extraordinary um, text. Um, and um, Matthew Vale, who's a who's um, a somewhat younger scholar. Um, and uh, let's see, Danielle Nussberger. Nussberger, she's at uh, she's at Marquette. Um, let's see who. Uh, um, anyway, the the others are. Um, um, oh, Sean or uh, Scott Caldell. Um, you may you may know her or you may know him. He also does a, a lot of stuff in in um um. Um, the the Girard space, and I, I want to get the name of of uh, of the um, of the other. Oh, Chelsea King, of course, Chelsea King. She's a younger scholar. Um, she's written on Girard, incredible stuff, great stuff for from her too. So I kind of want to um, highlight the the. The, the names of the other participants, but you may be familiar with them and and yeah. and and some of the stuff related to Gerard, um, you know, rather than the more academic, you mm -hmm. know, text in the art, you, you might find it a little bit more conversational there and see some kind of um, um, dialogue to and fro that might be engaging for you. Well, thank you for sharing that. So thank I you. will I will send that out to everybody who signed up for this evening. And I am being reminded by one of our Theology and Peace uh, folks to remember that the registration is already open for the conference. There is an early bird special there as well. Go to theologyandpeace.com uh, or you may have received uh, a link to that registration in an email from Theology and Peace. Uh, we will continue at that conference these types of conversations, engagements, uh, push our envelope or our thinking and, and really uh, come away with uh, things we can bring to our parishes, our colleges, our homes uh, that uh, really can help us throughout the year. So I'm going to make sure no one's reminding me of anything else.
All right. Thank, Thank you, you and have a good evening, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.